heavy than that, and that is, how many of you are thinking, either planning to clerk or thinking of, of clerkships after, after graduation? Oh, wow, I, I'm very, very impressed, and I, I encourage you to do it. But I do want to encourage you to think about clerking for a state Supreme Court. It's not uh, always the first, I know at least one of you is gonna do that, but uh, it's not always the first thought. Um, but I have to tell you, especially being on a state Supreme Court and seeing uh, our clerk's experience, um, there's really two reasons why I, I commend that experience to you. First of all, most state Supreme Courts, if not all, are discretionary, primarily discretionary review courts. And that means really, typically, really interesting and or consequential cases. And so there, I can tell from my clerk's uh, experiences that they are, um, they're fun. They're a lot of fun to work on those cases. The second is that you form lifelong bonds with your co-clerks. Uh, you know, if you work for a, a, a federal court of appeals or, or a district court, it can be an isolating experience and your interactions with these other incredible young people um, are episodic uh, rather than, um, than uh, regular and ongoing. And so uh, I hope that, that, uh, that you will consider those things. I have listed my uh, email address um, and uh, also, I have a website that contains some of my articles and, and all of my opinions. And also, um, you will find on there are three cases that I plan to discuss from the Arizona Supreme Court um, uh, a little bit today. Um, so don't hesitate to contact me on any, <laughs> on any issue, whether it's something that we chat about today or just um, career advice or anything like that, I, I really uh, consider um, this part of the job uh, the most fun and I uh, really, really love to, to interact with people outside of, of these forums. So um, the idea of judicial activism, you probably never had anyone come here before to talk in favor of judicial activism. <laughs> it's the one thing that everyone agrees on, that judicial activism is a bad thing. Um, my talk today is, is based on a book that I wrote in uh, 2007 called David's Hammer, and the subtitle is The Case for an Activist Judiciary. I published it with the Cato Institute, and uh, after I submitted my draft, uh, David Bowes from the Cato Institute, they said, uh, you know, it's we like the book, we're, you know, we're excited to publish it, but we think you should come up with a different subtitle. <laughs> and I said, no, I really like this subtitle, and, and it's, it's intended to be provocative and controversial, and um, I said, so he came up with a whole bunch of reasons why I should change the subtitle, and I'll never forget the last one, and he thought, this was totally his ace in the hole. He said, you will never be a judge if you publish a book, <laughs> if you publish a book with this subtitle. And I said, David, I'm never going to be a judge anyway, so I'm not going to worry about it too much. Well, sure enough, and you know, I moved to Arizona. Uh, well, before the book, book, book was published, I was already in Arizona. But um, uh, Governor Ducey is elected, and I decide to apply for a position on the uh, on the Arizona Supreme Court, and guess what was controversial? <laughs> that book, right? Um, and uh, but it but it actually turned out to be a, a, a really fun experience. Um, we have merit selection for judges, uh, so we have to go through a, a commission. And one of the questions, unsurprisingly, was, "What is your position on judicial activism?" Uh, which had never been asked before, and I suspect uh, that that book was the, the genesis of that question. And uh, hopefully, I was the only candidate who aced that uh, that question uh, during the interview. But um, judicial activism is a, a, a universal epithet. Um, uh, you know, every nominee uh, for the U.S. Supreme Court has been accused of supporting judicial activism, whether they're on the right or on the left. Uh, what, is, what is less universal is any sort of coherent definition of what judicial activism is. 
Um, there have been a, a few people uh, uh, who have attempted to define it, um, but basically what it comes down to is for most people, the definition of judicial activism is decisions that they disagree with. Um, so if they don't like a decision and you're a proponent of it, whether it's uh, uh, the current nominee to the Supreme Court or, or Gorsuch or whoever, um, uh, they, they accuse you of judicial activism and that's, that's the end of the, the discussion. It's a, a damnation. Um, my definition of judicial activism is simple and that is courts striking down unconstitutional laws or, um, uh, or regulations. Uh, and by that definition, I believe that the greatest problem with judicial activism is not that there is too much of it, but that there is not nearly enough of it. The power of the judiciary to rein in unconstitutional laws and, and government actions was one of the most revolutionary innovations of our Constitution. And for those of you who are interested in the topic um, and have not read this, I commend to you uh, the Federalist Number 78, which set forth um, the importance of the power of the independent judiciary. It was written by a guy who has become pretty um, popular and, and um, uh, chic lately, Alexander Hamilton. Um, and the, the, the insight from Federalist 78 is that, uh, um, is that the executive and the legislative branches have a natural and voracious tendency to overstep their constitutional bounds, to expand their power, and that the independent judiciary is an ideal counterweight to that. Um, the impulse, even if judges have an impulse to expand their own power, they do so primarily by shrinking the power of the other two uh, branches of government. Um, and that is because the legitimate power of the, ju of the judiciary is negative. Um, that is, to constrain the power of, of the other two branches. And as a result, Hamilton in Federal 78 said, um, that the judiciary would always be the least dangerous branch of government. Uh, but he did emphasize, and these words were, were, uh, were prescient, um, that there would be danger in the judiciary if ever the judiciary were to exercise the powers of the other branches, that is, the legislative power or the executive power. And the, the understanding of Federalist Number 78 is embodied in one of the most famous decisions in the history of American jurisprudence, and, and certainly the most important decision, which was Marbury versus Madison, which famously declared that it is emphatically the province and the duty of the judicial department to declare what the law is. I can't emphasize enough, we, we take that for granted now. You know, we sit and wait for the latest pronouncement of the US Supreme Court as to whether a particular law is constitutional or not. Um, and we, it, it rarely occurs to us, wow, this is really a big deal. And I mentioned uh, Texas versus Johnson a few minutes ago, the idea that, uh, that the court uh, could actually negate laws that had been enacted in almost every state banning flag desecration. The, the case that motivated me uh, to become uh, a lawyer was Brown versus Board of Education, uh, a regime of legal segregation throughout much of, of, uh, of the country supported by uh, dem the democratic branches of government and those states struck down by the US Supreme Court. It is, it is uh, uh, we, we take that sort of thing for granted now and yet uh, it truly is uh, revolutionary. So how are we doing in fulfilling the framers' vision in regard for the, the, um, uh, the, the judiciary being the, uh, the watchdog uh, for policing uh, the boundaries of the other branches of government? Well, first of all, I do have to say that Hamilton's warning about the courts uh, uh, potentially becoming a dangerous branch um, have proved prophetic. In many instances, courts have strayed 
from their judicial role and exercised legislative or executive powers. And I found on my own court um, that uh, much to my own surprise, um, I have spent a, a lot of attention uh, trying to prevent the court from <coughs> doing uh, from rewriting laws, for example, uh, you'll 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 see a statute that um, just doesn't make any sense. And uh, Justice Scalia used to say, you know, if we have uh, if we are interpreting a statute that is pure garbage, our constitutional obligation is to return the garbage, uh, not to make it smell better or look better but just to effectuate what the legislature has given us. It is not to rewrite it, it's not to make it better. And we do, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, all too often, uh, the courts will, uh, will exercise uh, either an executive or a legislative role. While we're doing too much of that, we're not doing nearly enough in terms, in my view, of striking down laws that are unconstitutional. And I hasten to add, there's good faith disagreement on what laws are unconstitutional, and, and, and I, don't, uh, I don't intend to take a, a normative position on that, um, but rather to look at, at, at volume as an example. Just give you one, one statistic. In 1958, the U.S. Code, which is the compilation of all federal laws, uh, contained 11,472 pages. It took us 169 years to get to that 11,472 pages. As of 2018, 60 years later, the U.S. Code had expanded to 60,000 pages five times the number of pages uh, that, that uh, the code consumed um, 60 years previously. That doesn't even count the massive growth of government at the state and local levels. So if we have five times as many laws as we did in 1958, one would think that we would have five times as many decisions striking down unconstitutional laws. That is not even remotely, remotely the case. So perhaps the explanation is Congress and the states and cities don't pass as many unconstitutional laws anymore. I doubt that that is the genuine explanation. Um, so, uh, and, and I, I give a couple, a few examples in that regard. In the old days, I, I am somewhat of a historian when it comes to the 14th Amendment, which uh, those of you who know the history of the 14th Amendment know that it derives in part from the Civil Rights Act of 1866. There is abundant <coughs> legislative history on the Civil Rights Act of 1866, uh, and I, I won't go into uh, the, the, uh, the substance of that, though I'd, I'd be delighted to during Q&A if anyone's interested. But, um, about half of the legislative debate was consumed over worries about whether Congress had power to do what it did. Um, and in fact, uh, President Andrew Johnson vetoed the Civil Rights Act of 1866 because he said that it was unconstitutional. And then Congress said, you know what, he may be right, we're going to constitutionalize this and, and turn it into a part of, uh, of our Constitution, which obviously did empower uh, the federal government um, uh, in, in, in many significant uh, ways. And that was true all throughout the 19th century. The first issue that Congress would take up was its power to do what, whatever it was considering doing. When's the last time you heard about a debate like that? Every, every now, Senator, and then Senator Rand Paul will say something about that, but he's about the only one. And just to give you two examples, uh, when the McCain-Feingold uh, law uh, restricting campaign contributions was passed, President um, George W. Bush signed it, and he said, I have profound doubt about the constitutionality of parts of this law, but I'm going to let the courts sort it out. Um, it, in the old days, a president, if, if a president had profound doubts about the constitutionality of a bill, the president would have vetoed it. 
and then uh, required Congress to repass it without the unconstitutional parts. But Bush signed it and just sent it to the, to the, uh, to the courts to, to decide. Um, when Obamacare passed, uh, Speaker Pelosi famously said, we have to pass this bill in order to find out what's in it, right? And I, I assume that that was a, mis, a misstatement on her part, but it's also revealing these laws are massive. We cannot expect legislators to sit and think about uh, whether they have the authority to do it. They just, they just pass it. Then, of course, this problem is exacerbated by the massive growth of the administrative state, which is where so many uh, laws uh, regulating us are passed. Uh, the Code of Federal Regulations is three times the size of the U.S. Code, and, it has, and we have eight times as many pages uh, in, in the Code of Federal Regulations as we did in 1960. That problem, in turn, is exacerbated by the Chevron Doctrine, uh, which holds that courts should defer not to just the agency's expertise on substantive regulations, but even on legal interpretation. Um, so it seems that, in my mind, seems to present serious separation of powers issues, um, uh, and it may represent the greatest example of judicial abdication of its responsibilities um, uh, in our entire history. Since joining my court in 2016, I have tried to move my court, help move my court in a more activist direction. That is the one concern I have with this being live streamed because if my colleagues hear me say that, they will say, well, crap, we gotta stop that as quickly as possible. Um, and uh, in doing so, I have uh, uh, tried to, to uh, I, I've tried to do that in a, in a number of ways. In part, that simply means being a textualist. If you are a textualist, um, then many laws uh, that, uh, that are passed uh, are going to be unconstitutional because a cardinal principle of textualism is that you give meaning to every word in the Constitution. Um, and I'll give uh, a couple of examples of, of where courts fail to, to do that. Um, so for example, when Robert Bork was nominated to the US Supreme Court, um, uh, and Bork was a, a Federalist Society stalwart, uh, one of the issues that came up were, was his views on the Ninth Amendment. And Bork said, I have no idea what the Ninth Amendment means. And it's like uh, an ink blot on the Constitution. What would a judge do if the framers had said, Congress shall make no law and then spill the bottle of ink on the Constitution? It would be irresponsible for the judge to interpret that ink blot. And my, my response to Bork uh, would have been then and, and, and is today, there are no ink blots. If it's in the Constitution, it is our responsibility um, to figure out what, uh, what those words mean and to, to give effect to them. I've also uh, been a huge proponent, and I'll be speaking uh, tomorrow uh, at Northwestern and then a week from Friday on a Fetty Night fight uh, about, uh, about the topic of state constitutionalism. And this has been an area uh, interpreting state constitutions has really become more of an, in most states, and especially in this state. Um, and uh, just as uh, Justice William Brennan urged in the 70s and 80s uh, that uh, state courts give a more robust interpretation to their constitution, uh, so do I advocate that uh, not only in Arizona, but, but elsewhere. I've also taken on a couple of sacred cow doctrines uh, that I think prevent uh, or limit judicial activism uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, in the most positive sense of the word. Um, in a case called State versus Arevalo, um, one of my colleagues and I took on something that you learn in law school um, in your con law class, probably all of 30 seconds are devoted to it, um, and then you just you take that to the bank. And if you see it on the bar exam, you know instantly to apply it, 
and that is the presumption of constitutionality. The notion that a law, when it's challenged, um, is presumed to be constitutional. Now we have, when you think of the most pervasive symbol of American justice, it's the scales of justice, right? They're evenly balanced. Yet if you challenge a law, they're not evenly balanced. The, the government comes in with presumption. So in State versus Arevalo, um, I said, uh, well, with one of my colleagues, that this places, this presumption places a thumb on the scales of justice. Um, and uh, we receive it from federal jurisprudence, but as a state court, we are not obligated to apply a presumption of constitutionality. Now this presumption is justified because the political branches take an oath to the Constitution just like we do. But I gave you an example a little while ago where the president said, you know, that's their oath, that's not necessarily my oath. And uh, the separation of powers has, has been construed um, to mean that judges should not substitute their policy judgment for the policy judgment of the elected branches. I agree with that emphatically. It come, if it comes down to a policy decision, the legislature and the executive get to make that. But on whether a law transgresses the boundaries of, of constitutional power for one of the other branches, why on earth would we ever surrender our authority to them to decide their own constitutional power. So, um, uh, so uh, I have uh, argued that um, uh, that we ought not to uh, indulge a presumption of constitutionality. And then, in this one, uh, I want to use an Illinois case as an example. And how impolite is it to come in as a guest to a state and then slam their Supreme Court? Right. Well, I'm going to do that. Um, but uh, in a case called State versus Maestas, um, in 2018, uh, in a concurring opinion, I took on um, the second part of the political question doctrine. You have to be a total nerd like me uh, to, to really be interested in the political question doctrine. And, and this is something you need to know for the bar exam. So basically, federal courts will duck an issue if it flunks the political question doctrine. The political question doctrine has two, two main components to it. The first is, does the Constitution delegate the power to one of the other branches of government? If it does, then the courts don't decide it. I agree emphatically with that part of the political question doctrine. It is part of separation of powers and uh, occasionally comes into play. The second part of the political question doctrine asks, are there judicially discoverable and manageable standards to decide this issue? That to me is completely inappropriate um, because that means that if we feel that there are no judicially discoverable and manageable standards, whatever that means, then the political branches, again, get to decide the limits of their own constitutional uh, authority. And, and the example I wanted to provide in, in this context, um, and it's come, up, it's come up in Arizona in the context of, we have a, a, um, a constitutional provision that says that tuition at our universities needs to be as free as possible. This is not a precise terminology, right? Um, and yet, as a textualist, I believe that it's our responsibility, should we get a case, uh, to enforce, you know, to enforce that, uh, that language. Here in Illinois, um, which uh, I, uh, I litigated a case during the 1990s on behalf of school children here uh, in Chicago. Um, who were uh, consigned to uh, a, a, a poor education in the public schools. And the Illinois Constitution goes further than any other constitution I know of in guaranteeing a right to education. It guarantees an efficient system of high quality education. An efficient system of high quality education. Now a few of you are chuckling because you're thinking, 
<laughs> no doubt, gee, they don't seem to be doing that, right? <laughs> and indeed, we represented 50 Chicago families who felt very strongly that their, uh, their children were not receiving a high quality education. And we were, in that case, requesting a damages remedy, in, that, in essence, a voucher remedy that would allow them uh, to, to go to schools that, that do provide a high, high quality education. And in terms of what, the, what standard the courts should apply, we did something rather bold. We said, we invite the defendants to articulate what that means. And we will show that whatever they say it means, <laughs> it doesn't satisfy that. And the Illinois uh, court, well, the trial court judge, and then the Illinois uh, Court of Appeals said, it's a political question. We have, there is no way for us to figure that out. We can figure out medical malpractice cases. We can figure out uh, all sorts of other, you know, criminal law cases, but we can't figure that one out. And therefore, the legislature gets to decide whether the system and how the system is to be made efficient and high quality. That's the sort of question that I think that if, if a court decides that way, as the Illinois Court of Appeals did, that means that the constitutional right does not exist. And those words have, a, have simply been uh, removed. Uh, from the Constitution, and that's that's why I went off on this uh, the second question, and you know invite uh, greater judicial uh, activism uh, as a result. So I want to give you a couple of examples where um, uh, where I think the court, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court, and then my court have really gone off the rails on not being activist enough, and again. I think all of these cases can be debated as to whether the law at issue is unconstitutional or not. But, but basically cutting off that argument and saying it's not, you know, it's not a, a, a proper question uh, for the court or construing the constitutional provision in a way that renders its meaning, uh, it meaningless uh, is not legitimate. And the first is my all-time all -time least favorite case uh, it's one that very few con law providers spend much time on. I spend an entire class talking about it, and that's the slaughterhouse cases. Um, when you look at the 14th Amendment, oddly enough, the very first provision of the 14th Amendment confers, guarantees citizens the privileges or immunities of citizenship. One would think that being first, like the First Amendment is first, it means something significant. And then also, when you think about it, it's the only one of the, of the trilogy of protections in the 14th Amendment that is substantive. The others are due process and equal protection. Obviously, due process has been interpreted to provide, in my, in my opinion, wrongly only because of the slaughterhouse cases. Um, uh, to confer substantive rights uh, as to some extent has, has the Equal Protection Clause. Uh, but in the slaughterhouse cases, which were decided before the ink was even dry on the 14th Amendment, a majority of the court, and this was an extraordinarily unusual five to four decision. Now, you know, most decisions are five to four decisions, but in that time, almost, almost no decisions were five to four. Uh, the majority of the court, uh, in the context of a monopoly for butchering that had been en enacted uh, as a result of, of a lot of bribery. Uh, I know that's hard to believe in Louisiana, but um, it, did, it did apparently happen. Um, uh, a monopoly was con conferred upon a single slaughterhouse that had the result of putting butchers out of business. Despite the fact that privileges or immunities at that time had a very clear definition that included freedom of enterprise, freedom of contract, freedom of labor. Um, the court uh, held that essentially the privileges or immunities clause meant access to ports and other federal constitutional rights uh, that were in the original constitution. Um, they held that um, uh, that the, the clause did not protect these butchers 
over uh, three very, very passionate and, and well-reasoned dissents. This decision, in turn, unleashed all sorts of terrible things. For example, Plessy versus Ferguson was decided under the Equal Protection Clause because the Privileges or Immunities Clause was not available um, as, uh, uh, as a tool. Um, it was much tougher to argue that, um, uh, that separate but equal was um, uh, laws were unconstitutional under the Equal Protection Clause at the time because these sorts of provisions were so ubiquitous at the time the 14th Amendment was adopted. Privileges or immunities would have offered freedom of contract as uh, a basis on which to strike down the separate but equal laws. Uh, the same day that Slaughterhouse was decided, the Supreme Court held that in Illinois law that forbade women from practicing law was also constitutional. That one is embarrassing. It was an eight to one decision. That to the court was a much easier question uh, than the, the question of the butcher monopoly. And um, Slaughterhouse gives us a substantive due process, which gives everyone a hard time on the bar exam because there shouldn't have to be a substantive due process. And the only reason there is there is such a thing is uh, because of the slaughterhouse cases, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, Bork, um, Bork referred to the slaughterhouse cases as a narrow victory for judicial moderation. So this is what, what I characterize as, as a clear example of judicial abdication as opposed to appropriate judicial activism or judicial action. In my own court, um, we had a case called State versus Mixton, and Arizona is one of only two states that has an explicit privacy protection in our Constitution that guarantees that people's private affairs will be protected except with authority of law. The question that came to us was whether a warrant was necessary to gain a criminal suspect's IP address and ISP data. And so the question was argued under, uh, under both the Fourth Amendment and the Privacy Clause of our Constitution. Under the Fourth Amendment, the answer could not have been less clear. Uh, those of you who studied Fourth Amendment warrant uh, jurisprudence, especially recent jurisprudence, it is almost impossible to make sense out of it and to come to a clear conclusion on that. My argument, and this was a four to three decision in which I wrote the, the, the dissenting opinion, uh, my argument was it's not very difficult under the Arizona Constitution because IP addresses and ISP data are a private affair. You don't expect when you give up, when you sign up for, for uh, you know, a website or something like that, that you were giving the police permission to have that, uh, to have that data. And of course we use uh, uh, historical analysis and so forth. The majority said, no, the private affairs clause means the same thing as the Fourth Amendment, notwithstanding the fact that the Fourth Amendment language was proposed to the constitutional framers and rejected in favor of the privacy uh, provision. This has been um, a decision that, uh, that I have uh, critiqued both, uh, uh, both in academic writings as well as uh, through the, um, uh, my dissenting opinion. In many cases, my court has uh, uh, has taken a more textualist position and, and given uh, full meaning to uh, provisions of, uh, of the Constitution. And I'll conclude with one such example, one recent example, and I didn't, didn't write it down because I didn't uh, publish an opinion in that particular case. But a number of state constitutions have provisions that I would love to see in the US Constitution but aren't there. They provide either greater protection for individual rights than does the, for, uh, the, the US Constitution or greater constraints on the power of government. One of them is called the single subject provision which requires that all legislation contain one single subject. This was designed to prevent a, a legislative practice called log rolling, which is, I can't get this bill passed. I don't have enough votes for it. 
I win it for my, my district, but it, it doesn't concern other people. I will stick it in a bill that does have majority vote and people have no choice but to enact my, my bill. It happens, of course, in Congress all the time. And it can happen all the time because there's not a single subject provision. So uh, this is in our state constitution and like so many provisions, hasn't really been particularly robust. The last legislative session, um, the uh, Republicans have a one vote majority in, in both houses, which makes it very difficult for them to pass a lot of stuff. And they passed, um, they passed a number of, of uh, popular conservative measures. They banned critical race theory. They, um, they banned the governor's executive emergency orders and all sorts of things that many of which I personally would have, if I were a legislator, I would have supported. Um, to add spice to this, my wife happens to be in the legislature and she voted for all of these things <laughs> as part of the budget. And the Arizona uh, School Boards Association challenged uh, this, uh, these provisions under, this, under the single subject rule. We took a look at the text of this and we struck it all down. <laughs> um, my wife would have been really angry at me but uh, yeah, of course, we never discuss the cases uh, you know, that, that I am looking at. Um, but the moment she saw this lawsuit, she said, I know which way you're going to vote on this. Um, so she had already made peace with it long before we even came down with our decision. But that's the sort of thing. How do you, how do you make that, that, uh, that provision meaningful unless you go to court? And if the court abdicates in, in enforcing that, then it doesn't exist. If we looked at that, and in fact, the legislature said, this is our decision. We have the power to pass a budget. Therefore, don't bug us, right? Let us, let us figure all of this out. And we looked at that provision, and, and, and I wanted to add on a, on a note on which I'm proud rather than a critic. Um, uh, we unanimously uh, unanimously struck that down, and if the legislature has majority support for these provisions, they can repass them. Um, but without it, I think uh, I think that uh, our framers' efforts to prevent exactly the type of practice that happened there uh, would be would be for naught. So with that, I hope that any predilections you came in with regarding judicial activism as being a disgraceful thing are at least mildly softened. And with that, um, I would be delighted to have your, your questions and again, follow up commentary. Thank you so much for having me today. If, if you don't mind, I'd like to try to get to know um, folks as, as well as best I can. Um, tell me uh, uh, what year you are in law school and uh, where you're originally from, and if you have a clerkship lined up, I'd love to know who that who that is with. So, yeah, uh, I'm Ben Lipkin. I'm a one L. I don't. Oh, really cool. Have a yes. <laughs> um, nice um, to meet you, Ben. Yeah, and where are you from? Where are you from? from uh, Ohio. Oh, awesome. And awesome. I'm working at IJ this summer. Oh, very <laughs> cool. And I I litigated a lot in Ohio, so great experience. Yeah. So I had a question. You spoke against the presumption of constitutionality. Uh, would you go so far as in the other direction as to be in favor of the presumption? So that's a that's a really good question. My friend uh, Professor Randy Barnett uh, has written extensively about that. Uh, boy, would that be an even bigger sea change? It, you know, I'm like I'm the lonely voice, even saying there shouldn't be a presumption. Um, but I do think I find, uh, and I and I I have to duck that question a little bit because I haven't really. Um, gotten into uh, his argument that much and, and so many of my opinions are, are forged by the arguments that are, are brought to us. Um, but his argument essentially is that's what the Ninth Amendment is all about. The Ninth Amendment is, uh, uh, is not so much a substantive guarantee of rights but rather a directional signal. Um, and that, um, that 
certainly appeals appeals to me and i would be very open to that in a in a particular case where i have gone in that direction is um unlike the u.s constitution which except for the ninth amendment and except for the the preamble really doesn't have those kinds of directional signals most state constitutions do and they talk about um the constitution being that the purpose of the constitution being to protect individual rights i pointed that out in my presumption of constitutionality uh, uh, concurrence because uh, it seems odd that in a constitution that in two separate places defines the constitution's purpose as protecting individual rights to then have a presumption of constitutionality when someone is asserting one of those rights seems even more uh, bizarre um, and countertextual. So, so I've gone at least that far, but I would certainly, you know, we don't, to say that we don't get very many Ninth Amendment cases is a dramatic understatement, but I, I would certainly entertain that, um, that argument. Let's start with you, you, and you. Hi, uh, I'm Courtney. I'm, Hi, Courtney. Uh, I'm from Willow Park, Illinois, originally. Uh, you want the clerk to flag up, yeah. Uh, so my question was just, um, you talked a lot about like being willing to strike down you know, laws that are unconstitutional. I was just wondering like how far that goes. You know, there's a lot of discussion of like super precedents. Should those receive more deference? Are there even super yeah. precedents? I was just curious. <laughs> yeah, that. yeah. And that, that gets to almost a converse. Um, <laughs> A converse question, which is, sorry, to size us. Mm -hmm. You know, um, not only are there bad laws, but there are bad, <laughs> there are bad precedents. Mm -hmm. And I guess I, I tend to to follow Justice Thomas's mm -hmm. admonition, and it ha in fact uh, quoted one at, at great length in one of my opinions. Um, so no, I don't think there is such a thing as a super precedent. I just, I just. Gosh, our job is already hard enough <laughs> without having to decide which president is a super president, you know. And having, having said that, I do think um, that there is something to um, the um, oh my gosh, which is uh, uh, which is the abortion precedent uh, that that the trio wrote. I'm not sure whether you've taken. And I, I, I'm just Casey, Casey, Casey yeah. Um, the discussion, their discussion of stare decisis, which pertained to um, whether people have have essentially um, uh, uh, an interest, um, a stake in preserving an opinion, a wide number of people like Slaughterhouse. You know, would not be entitled to that kind of deference, in my opinion, because you know the only people who rely on that are state governments and rent seekers. Um, so, you, by contrast, a decision that legalizes marriage, even if it's, even if it may not have been correctly decided, a lot of people have a reliance interest in, in that liberty. So, I, I would find it. Um, uh, I would find the stare decisis uh, um, argument to be to be particularly strong in a, in a case like that. Um, but um, but but apart from that, one one of the areas where I've been critical in state constitutional law is a lot of state constitutional cases um, have said, well, this provision. Is, is similar to the federal provision, therefore we will follow federal jurisprudence. And the extent of the analysis is nearly nothing. And then you've hitched your train <laughs> to, the, to the zigzaggy federal jurisprudence that, that follows. Um, I've argued that that is entitled to zero stare decisis effect, that there should be a first analysis, the first ever analysis, and mixed in was one of one of those cases where you know the majority says we've always interpreted this in lockstep with the Fourth Amendment, 
And the, the initial analysis in the case that decided that was 50 words long. And to me, that's just not, somebody for, has to someday for the first time go into that history and decide and language and see, uh, see what it really means. And if, if it is the same as the Fourth Amendment, then so be it. I, I, I can't imagine that that would be the case. So I, that's a bit of a rambling, a, more than a bit of a rambling answer to your question, but that's, that's my reaction to that. So and then, yes. Uh, hi there, I'm Stephen, um, uh, one L from Indianapolis. I'm curious on, you know, you talked about separation of powers in this conversation, and sure, the judicial like evaluation of the law's constitutionality seems reasonable, but I'm curious in the remedies part, at what point do you start to see a breakdown in separation of powers if yes. they're proposing some, a solution like vouchers that seems yes. to be a legislative so, remedy? So it's so funny that you say that, um, because of course that is a, a, an issue that we had to, to deal with. Um, and it's, it's only in the area of education, in my view, that the idea of damages would appear to be legislative, but the idea of a court taking over a school district and managing it would seem non-legislative or non-executive. And it's so, and, and yet that has really come uh, come to pass. Damages are typically, um, you know, if if the if uh, you know if the police violate your rights, you know, there's no question that, a, except for qualified immunity, which is a big except, uh, that a damages remedy, you know, is 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 forthcoming. But in education, oh my gosh, and couldn't possibly do that. So we were trying to argue, obviously unsuccessfully here um, that this would actually be the right type of judicial remedy um, but um, and, and a modest type of judicial remedy we, we look at how much uh, the state has allocated for this child's education we subtract some of the massive administrative costs and you know and we provide that as, as a measure of damages um, so but but you are absolutely right. It is in the area of judicial remedies where uh, Hamilton's warnings really are, are the most prophetic. And education is perhaps the area where that has, um, has uh, most come to, to pass. For example, um, forced busing was a judicial remedy. You know, we are going to decree that every school has uh, a particular racial ratio and order you to transport children to make that, to effectuate that. To me, the, you, a, a, court, um, a court decrees that the, that the system is unconstitutional and recedes uh, until a constitutional remedy is devised by, you know, by the, the legislative and executive branches. Obviously, there was resistance to that, and at some point, you come in with sanctions and, you know, and, and those sorts of things. Um, but, uh, but that really is is where I see. Uh, judicial activism displaced by what I would refer to as judicial lawlessness, which is where the judiciary is, is taking on these um, these additional powers. I'll, I'll, I have a feeling yours is on point with that, but I'll come right back. I'll come right I think back. I actually really have time for about one more question. Okay. But if you're let's see if we can sneak, around, let's see if we can sneak in, sneak in both of these. So, Angel Malkar, Missouri, Albuquerque, Justice that's awesome! Oh my gosh, I adore Justice Timmer, and all of my all of my comments. She voted with me on Nixon. So. <laughs> no, she's fantastic. I look forward to having you. You moved in your discontent with the second part of the political question doctrine. Yes. And um, you know, I took admin law last quarter. You mentioned the Chevron doctrine, and one of the justifications for the Chevron doctrine is the expertise of the regulatory agencies. Um, I also went to an event Friday with, just, with Judge Easterbrook, and he said judges are ignorant when it comes to certain <laughs> subjects. So with those two ideas in mind, I guess yeah. my question is, um, do you truly believe 
that um, I guess certain laws that are presented to judges are, I guess, truly like don't have a meaning, like they're garbage in Justice Scalia's terms? Or is it that maybe the judge at the time lacks the knowledge, lacks the expertise to interpret that law? So they, you know, take the easy way out. Oh. <laughs> well, I would cede to no one a greater expertise in deciding legal, legal issues. Um, I would defer to lots of people, almost everybody other than myself, expertise on like, uh, you know, environmental policy and, and those sorts of things. So there, and, and so where I really, really think that, uh, that Chevron goes off the rails is in saying that a court uh, cannot um, decide the legal boundaries of you know of agency authority and that sort of thing and if there are factual issues that's what trials are are all about and unlike a regulatory agency or a legislature you actually both have the same number of witnesses you can have the same num same number of pages in your in your brief and that sort of thing um, and so I actually think having that referee, even though the referee is not um, not trained in that particular subject, which is true of, of a huge amount of stuff that cases that we get. But interpreting a regulation and interpreting a statute and of course a constitutional <coughs> provision, I, I, I would I, I would not cede that expertise, especially to a party that has an interest in a particular outcome. Um, and so, um, uh, so, so I would respectfully disagree with Judge Easterbrook on on that. And if if we're if we're okay to do quickly, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask. And you, you are? Oh, my name is Matt Phillips from the Two O. Um, I just wanted to ask if you think that judicial activism should vary based on a particular group of judges' accountability to the political body. So. You know, state judges are often appointed by governors or elected, but federal judges have lifetime appointments through sort of national. Appointments. Yeah, so that's a, that's a really good question. I'll give it a, a short answer. So the answer, the shortest answer is no, because I think it derives from our constitutional oath. Um, but the longer answer is a little bit. <laughs> and uh, Jeff Sutton, in his most recent book on state constitutionalism, points out that state judges typically are more accountable. Um, they often face retention elections and that sort of thing. And that state statutes and especially state constitutions are more amendable, are more easily changed. And as a result of that, um, state judges can have a bit more latitude in that regard. I'm not sure that I agree with him, but he's made an awfully convincing argument. I, I'm going to try to get it right, period, and not not ever exercise uh, such greater um, greater autonomy. Um, but uh, but he makes I think he makes a really interesting argument in that regard. And with that, your questions are as awesome as I expected. <coughs> Thank you very much.